Hello and a very warm welcome to the brand new edition of To The Point. I'm Kriti Mishra. And on today's show, I have a very special guest, Chairman of the 15th Finance Commission, Mr. N.K. Singh. Mr. Singh, welcome to Ratsabha Television and thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Sir, let's begin this conversation by talking about your autobiography, Portraits of Power. Now, it focuses on different phases of your life. You have decades of experience in policy making. How do you look at the journey so far? Well, it has been, uh, as is to be expected, a journey full of uncertainties, uh, full of uh, acts of uh, trying to reconcile contradictions, acts of uh, trying to ensure uh, the best possible outcome from policy decisions, uh, moving away from being a traditional civil servant, uh, both in the state government and with the central government, the privilege of working as secretary in the Ministry of Finance, of Revenue, Expenditure and Finance, Economic Affairs, handling the balance payments crisis, working for several years with the legendary, iconic Sri Atal Bihari Vajpayee as his secretary. And there is a chapter in the book about the Vajpayee legacy. Then, of course, my six memorable years in the Rajya Sabha. And uh, then, of course, into uh, being drawn by the India government again, at first as chairman of the uh, Fiscal Responsibility Management Committee, uh, and then now currently as the chairman of the 15th Finance Commission. So it has been a long journey. Parts of the book also refer to what I heard, what I learned, and what I understood from the experience of my father, who was also a member of the Indian Civil Service, and by some strange accident of history that we both uh, were in the Ministry of Finance, he occupied the same rooms, which I did, with a difference of 30 years uh, or so. Uh, and so uh, I learned a lot from what I heard from him, because the, the, that kind of a generation of civil servants uh, in which the peer group was rather strong and it was immediately after the independence when the uh, British colonial rule had ended and the Indian civil service really was became increasingly more responsible and responsive to the needs of an elected government, meeting the aspirations of people who had been brought to power to represent the aspirations and the expectations of the people of India. Absolutely, sir. You're talking about the aspirations of people of India. Now, talking about the economic progression, so from balance of payment crisis to the era of LPG, liberalization, privatization, globalization to economic sanctions, and now to a point where we are one of the most preferred destinations for investment. How do you see the evolution of Indian economy? Well, I must say that the Indian economy, uh, going back a little earlier, it, in fact, uh, uh, at the initially when, at the time of my father, and then in the initial years of my own service, the critical issue was, of course, food security. Yes. Uh, we are now a major exporter of food grains. But in the initial periods, we were scrambling for food to feed our people. And the somewhat pejorative remark is still embedded in my mind when it was said that we lived from ship to mouth uh, when I initially began my service. From that time, to become a major exporter of agro and agro-based products, from a highly regulated economy in which uh, productivity, total factor of productivity, production capacity, private entrepreneurship was nascent, in fact, was absent. From a time when we did not, not only not welcome foreign investment, but hardly much foreign investment was coming. But after struggling for food security, we struggled to ensure that the balance of payments and that the reserves which we had were adequate to service debt. In fact, that was the, one of the critical challenges of 1991. If we look at really the period before 1991, periods of India's balance of payments crisis have invariably synchronized with few years of fiscal profligacy. And this was a lesson which was a difficult lesson to learn. 1991 made us learn this. It made us learn the advantages of deregulating the license permit raj, 
It taught us the power of private entrepreneurship. It taught us the ability of what foreign investment could be transformative, enabling a mindset change where foreign investment was equal to foreign exploitation. Uh, we hadn't forgotten for a long time that the East India Company had begun as a trading partner to become really colonial conquerors. So we were, for understandable reasons, very hesitant of accepting foreign, foreign investment. But we changed. The political leadership adapted, adjusted, and responded to the challenges when today, as you rightly point out, we are among the world's most favorite investment destination. If today, if anything, our foreign exchange reserves has a problem of how to manage the plenty because and how to allow the inward capital flows not to appreciate the currency in a manner which would prove injurious to our export capability. That's quite a transformation. Transformation from an economy of scarcity to an economy of plenty. From an economy of controls to an economy of what liberalization and productivity can do by bringing more coherent partnership between private capital and public outlays, between the ability of inviting the, the, the highest possible foreign companies with major investments in India. We look at our record now. Every company would buy to win India equally as people are looking to alternative destinations beyond China right. for geostrategic reasons. They are looking at India as an important destination for in order to exercise options and in order to exercise really the capability of gaining from this large, unsaturated emerging market where total factor productivity has still a long way to go. Certainly, there has been a paradigm shift. But sir, you mentioned about political will. Now, I'm intrigued to know, you've seen from close quarters the economic progression during the coalition governments and also during the single party governments. What is that one distinctive feature that comes to your mind? Well, I must say that uh, from a hesitant, risk averse political leadership to a leadership acting with panache. Look at our previous history. We hesitated for a long time to take the difficult decision of becoming a nuclear power. Uh, by the time we reached the period of Prime Minister Vajpayee, the confidence in our system had grown. Our economic strength had gathered momentum. So the leadership took that difficult decision to become a nuclear power. From that time, if you look at it, coupled with decisive leadership and political will, which you mentioned, and coupled with the capability and self-confidence which this government has, some of the most difficult decisions have been taken during the period of the Modi government. Let me recount a few. The Bankruptcy Insolvency Act, which for years the US investors were telling, what do we have as an exit policy? Something akin to Chapter 11 of the US bankruptcy law. Or for instance, the GST, which was in the making right from 1991 in some shape or the other, when we were talking to the International Monetary Fund, implemented during the time of the Modi government. Yes, sure, GST has many uh, hiccups, uh, many teething problems, many irritation, but that's a decisive step in giving India the advantage of one common market. You keep proceeding into some of the difficult decisions which have been even taken during the pandemic period of Prime Minister Modi converting the challenge into an opportunity, the challenge to continue with the economic reform momentum, multiple areas, in areas of power, in areas of agriculture, in areas of further opening up on the ease of business. And you take a whole host of initiatives on education, on health, for instance, really having the Medical Council of India, uh, a National Commission on, on Health to replace the medical debilitating influence of the Medical Council which for years had strangled hold the supply side responses to our health needs or an education, the new education policy, which offers emphasis on foundational learn courses, which in higher stages of learning allows the carry forward of credit, which allows you the flexibility of choices to pursue different forms of pedagogy. These are iconic reforms. These have been undertaken by leadership 
which is confident, which is self-assured, and which has the majority and the will to carry forward the far-reaching structural changes which will catapult Indian economy once the COVID begins to taper out to become, uh, again, a formidable major economic power. So that's a very pertinent point that you're making, and you also talked about converting challenges into opportunities. Now here I'd like to elicit your views on Art Nirbhar Bharat. Prime Minister has given a clarion call saying we must go vocal for local while having a global perspective. What are the chances for India? Let me put it this way. Uh, Prime Minister Modi is sanguine and is sagacious enough to realize that no country can afford, which wants to grow at 8%, and we certainly want to grow at 8% plus, can give up the engine of foreign trade as an important multiplier benefits. And that engine of foreign trade cannot be predicated on a protectionist Bharat. His, it's a miss. He has clarified more than once that an Atmanirbhar Bharat is not a protectionist Bharat. And Atmanirbhar Bharat is one. Let me give you an example. Isn't it, for instance, ironic that for something like production of medicine, the primary salt, a preponderant quantity of maybe 80, 90 percent of the salt just comes from one country, API, as it is known. And the Indian drug companies which existed petered out at the onslaught of this competition. Wouldn't it be sensible for us to develop strategic strength here? Or for instance, to give you another example, you take the our forest reserves in the whole of the Northeast. I was privileged to visit all the states in the Northeast and realized that their forest cover is enormous. Their bamboo production can compete with the best. And yet we're one of the biggest importers of wood products. Now, would it not be more sensible to give employment uh, to generate incomes here in substituting wood. Or for instance, given the fact that we are quite capable and that the climatic issues on the production of palm oil and uh, uh, mustard production have long been resolved for us to still continue to import vast quantities of edible oil. So these are examples where Atmanirbhar Bharat, in my view, strengthens our domestic capability, provides employment, enhances income. This is very dis different from saying that you want to become a protectionist Bharat and we want to prevent imports from coming in, which will only make our exports more uncompetitive. So I believe that Atmanirbhar Bharat must be understood in this broader context and not to make that symmetric with this kind of a suggestion that our, is India unlearning the lessons of the past and becoming protectionist once again. No, I think the two of them are really two faces of the same coin. And Atmanirbhar Bharat is the biggest guarantee of also using export competitiveness uh, by having continuing to have uh, an enabling export regime to allow foreign trade to be an engine of economic growth. Right, sir. So it's all about income, export competitiveness, and also about employment. But Mr. Singh, I'll just shift the focus a bit and talking about the Finance Commission. Now, it is in the process of finalizing the recommendations uh, for sharing the resources between the center and the state. Both center and the states would clamor for higher revenues and higher devolution. But as uh, the chairman of uh, the Finance Commission, the 15th Finance Commission, do you have the room or how will you perform this balancing act very frankly, you'll have to wait for the report, uh, which is going to be quite soon. Uh, you will have to really wait not only for our report, but you will have to await uh, the final decisions and that the president uh, takes on the recommendations of the 15th Finance Commission. But as I have said many a time earlier, that uh, finance commissions are about treating states and the union on the same footing. In fact, I have no hesitation to say that the cover of this Finance Commission's report has the two scales where the union and the states are equally balanced. So it has been the endeavor of this Finance Commission to have a degree of uniformity in terms of its consultation process, in terms of a discussion with stakeholders, and in terms of our entire approach and philosophy to view India 
as union of states, treating the states on the same footing as the union. But sir, this exogenous shock or this pandemic has disrupted economies worldwide. So amid this pandemic and given the fiscal pressure, how difficult is it to deal with the demands? Well, you know, it, it, is, it is not easy because uh, I have said so earlier that uh, the fiscal roadmap uh, needs to res be responsive and needs to be calibrated to address the challenge of the pandemic. That is why the Commission has seriously engaged in consultations of what kind of a new fiscal roadmap, and more than that, what kind of a roadmap in terms of not only fiscal deficits, but the debt to GDP. We have continued after the FRBM Act of 2018 to regard debt as the principal macroeconomic anchor, and the fiscal deficit is only an enabling uh, operational uh, kind of a parameter to achieve preferred levels of uh, debt to GDP as a whole. And debt to GDP, not only of the central government, because we are addressing the general government, the general government's debt to GDP, meaning the debt to of states and the debt of the union government taken together. We're also cognizant of the fact that uh, extraordinary situations need extraordinary responses, and maybe perhaps in recalibrating the fiscal and the debt trajectory, we would have to look to room for flexibility, flexibility both for the union and flexibility for the states as well. So are you hinting or are you suggesting at actually raising the FRBM limits? And right now, at least for right now, fiscal prudence can take a back seat? Well, I have said so in, in several interviews that this is a time for livelihood, this is a time for uh, supporting a recovery process. This is not a time for fiscal rectitude, but for, for fiscal forbearance. And this forbearance must inform policy choices of policymakers. The Finance Commission is not oblivious of these challenges. So borrowing seems to be the smart option. How sustainable is that? Let me put it this way. After all, it uh, doesn't require too much uh, understanding of complex economics. All borrowings are contingent and sustainable, depending not only on cost of borrowing, but more importantly, on the growth trajectory. If growth rates go up, it's easy enough to service the borrowing and service the debt. So the critical factor the X factor, so to say, in any fiscal trajectory is what and what probabilities do you have of growth rates going up in the medium term? I remain somewhat optimistic that in the post-pandemic period, some of these reform initiatives uh, which have been taken will enable our growth rates to get back to normal levels, to get back to a higher trajectory, and that will in the medium term, enable the servicing of the debt in a responsible manner. Sir, so, of course, states are making representation to you. Now, COVID-19 has had an indelible impact on our consumption, income, fiscal targets, deficits. What is your suggestion to those states? How do they recalibrate their strategy? Well, uh, no different. It doesn't require too much of an economist to say that you need action on two fronts. First and foremost, you need to reprioritize expenditure because quite clearly, one thing which the pandemic has brought out rather sharply is the inadequacy of our health infrastructure and that the state governments really are committed to the 2017 new health policy in which they are expected to, uh, to spend a certain quantum of resources for improving their health infrastructure. Reprioritizing expenditure is an important option which we would encourage the states to adopt. So this is one. Second, to clearly ensure that their own growth rates by the adoption of sensible policies are really uh, uh, reach a somewhat greater momentum as indeed of the central government. Growth rates of the state also need to be responsive 
in a somewhat post-pandemic period to register a much greater momentum, which would enable their debt and their borrowings to be serviced in also a responsible way. The suggestions are quite uniform for the union government and for the state governments as well. So here there's a very important element of GST compensation. Now the centre has said that it will borrow on behalf of the states to the tune of around 1.1 lakh crore rupees. But going ahead, how will this issue be addressed between the centre and states? What is your suggestion? Uh, in my view, this is a matter not in the domain of the Finance Commission. Uh, this is a matter in the domain of another uh, constitutionally empowered body, uh, the GST Council. And uh, it is not for us to comment on the working of the GST Council. But let me say that the uh, central government has been very responsible. At no point in time, it has sought to resign from the fact that they have to give the resources to the states based on the 14% assurance for the period of five years, which ends in July 22, which will cover the next two years of our award. And that for this, they have indicated in the last GST Council that the period of the cess will be extended to such a period which will enable them to discharge the obligation of being able to do this. And I think that, uh, at, therefore, really, if you ask me to some extent, this is... a uh, a controversy blown out of proportion because uh, we look at the debt and the fiscal deficits of the general government, and the general government means the center and the states. To some extent, therefore, this is a reshuffling of accounts. It doesn't matter too much uh, which entity does so, and that's something for the GST Council to look for what is the most efficient way in which uh, these extra borrowings can be affected, uh, consistent with the trajectory of the debt and the GDP of the general government as a whole. And lastly, Mr. Singh, green shoots are visible in various sectors. Do you think that the worst is over for Indian economy given this pandemic? Well, we hope so. Although, very frankly, we don't know the path of the pandemic as yet. But uh, don't forget two, two particular aspects. One, when people talk about the fact that our Q1 figures on GDP contraction was a high 23.5% or so. This must be reckoned in the background that we had one of the severest lockdown, 85% yes. uh, lockdown compared to many other countries. And in comparison to that, what has happened to our Q1 figures is certainly far better, uh, if we make the comparison, when their lockdown was much less severe than the lockdown which we did. And this lockdown enabled us to save lives. It enabled the health sector infrastructure to be refurbished in a manner to address the pandemic. So it has had its own advantages. And as we have begun to progressively uh, not only take away the restrictions and the lockdown is nearly, very nearly over, we need to be also cautious, as the Prime Minister has warned us, that the winter months can be difficult, particularly with so many festivals around the corner. We need to observe uh, the, the necessary uh, behave, personal behavior patterns on social distancing in terms of the use of masks, in terms of keeping personal hygiene and so on. And these are very important. So the first issue is that this curve of the COVID, which has, looks to have come down, this must be maintained, which can only be maintained provided the responsible behavior continues and that it doesn't really induce us to take other decisive steps which could further impair the economy. Based on this optimism and based on these expectations, I believe that the worst may be behind. I believe definitely that the worst is behind us and that we will, as pronounced earlier, that this year's GDP will be made up equally by a rebound of the economy in the next fiscal year. And then over a period of time, during the period of our five-year award, achieve a degree of normalcy and achieve the high growth rates which are necessary for India, not only to address important issues of poverty, important issues of infrastructure, important issues connected with health, important issues of the various growth multipliers, which only high rates of economic growth can give. So the worst is behind us. We are 
treading on the path of economic recovery. Of course, the onus is on all of us to be responsible. Thank you. All the best. Thank you so much for joining us and watching the To The Point show. Take care and stay tuned to Rajya Sabha Television. Watch India 